Shay or Sibolu. Uh, I will be taking you through this paper together with some of my colleagues that you will meet uh, you know, later on. However, I want to start with an introduction to the paper, some of the things you need to know. Now, I know that as I go through, you may have one or two questions you want to ask. Uh, please just hold the question until I open the floor for questions, okay? So I want to just run through this. It should take me 20 minutes or less or 30 minutes, and then I can take all your questions regarding uh, AFM and how, you know, we intend to run with the class. Lucky, I don't know why you started recording. Can you stop, please? All right, so in the meantime, uh, just to confirm, can you guys hear me and can you see my screen? Hey. Yeah, we I can, can hear you. All right, thank and you. And I can see your screen too. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so I think I'll just proceed. So, um, just okay. So, as you know, um, good afternoon again. So as you know, AFM is uh, one of the optional papers uh, in the ACCA curriculum. And, um, you know, you have to take two of the optional papers. You have other options. And uh, if you are listening to me now, then you are probably trying to make a decision about whether uh, to take this paper or to take some other papers, or maybe you have already made your decision. The objective now is pretty much to go through what this paper entails. I will go through um, the context in terms of the syllabus, overview of the syllabus, and then some of the things that you need to take note of as you um you know prepare for this paper so afm has about five sections of the syllabus the first area here is role of financial advisor in a multinational organization and then uh this role pretty much cuts across four fundamental areas so our review of the syllabus will predominantly focus on these four key areas. Now, for this first section around the rule, candidates are expected to understand, um, you know, the financial management function within an organization and how that function engages with various stakeholders. And then some of the key financial management decisions that um, you know, finance managers make uh, uh, in, in terms of you know, running a business. So whether it's be uh, decisions around dividend policy, for example, you know, or decisions around uh, any of these areas here, which I'm going to be narrowing down. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on those areas now. In addition, uh, there are certain organizations, you know, globally that plays a very important role within the finance uh, and economic function in an economy. 
<laughs> so for example, the World Bank, uh, the IMF and the types, uh, candidates are also expected to know their role and uh, you know why such organizations are important and what really is the objective for setting them up. But as I said, our focus will predominantly be on these four key financial management decisions that uh, CFOs and top finance managers often make. The first section is advanced investment appraisal. And the key point here is that managers need to make decisions around what projects to invest in, where to apply the finances that the entity has raised. Remember that if you look at the balance sheet of a company, you will typically have it financed by equity and liabilities, which may be debts, or fully equity finance, right? But then this financing needs to be invested in assets, right? So um, some of these assets are, you know, non-current assets, uh, substantial non-current assets, and are sometimes long-term investments. So one of the first things we're going to be looking at under advanced investment appraisal is the concept of impact that financing have on investment decision. So impact of financing on investment decisions. Now, the context here really is that the decision to invest in one asset or the other is often influenced by how you intend to finance that investment. If my financing cost is 10% and another party is also financing a similar project at 15%, it is more likely that I will recognize a higher MPV from that project because my cost of capital is lower. And there is even a chance that that other party may not be able to invest in that project because the NPV is negative. And that may be because the cost of funding is too high. So how I raise my capital and the cost of that capital has a fundamental impact on whether I'm going to accept that project, acceptance or otherwise, of the project. So one of the things we're going to be looking at that in that topic is how do we calculate cost of capital? Very popular concepts in financial management. How do we calculate project-specific cost of capital in a situation where we believe there are there's a need to make risk adjustments. How do we deal with bond yields and credit spreads? How do we deal with duration? How do we deal with the various sources of finance that are available and the capital structure theories that we have? That will be the focus under this first section of this area. The next topic we will then focus on are discounted cash flows. As you know, in appraising a project, there are different appraisal methods that can be used. One group of methods are often called discounted cash flow techniques. Now, if you look at these words, you will see that it's a consolidation of two separate things. One, the cash flows. Two, discounting. The discount rate you will use to discount cash flows of a project will often be the cost of capital of the company or a project specific cost of capital that you have computed. So it's then important for us to understand the appraisal methods that we have under discounted cash flows, such as APV, NPV, IRR, MIRR and the rest. So we're going to be taking a closer look at how to evaluate a project on financial grounds on the basis of, uh, uh, you know, these methods. And even also incorporating risk and uncertainties 
and considering other factors that are important. Now, when we say discounted cash flows, for the sake of your exam, you have to look at it from two types of projects, a domestic project or an international project. So we've had several past questions where candidates are asked to evaluate an international project. And obviously, when you decide to, inv uh, to invest in a foreign country, there are some peculiar issues around cash flows and discount rates that you have to deal with that are not present in a domestic project. And finally, in this area, we're going to be looking at the concept of option pricing, a very interesting topic. In life, there are several options you can take, often around decisions that are on your table. Different options will result in different outcomes sometimes. And uh, some options give you more flexibility and ability to uh, you know, navigate your way. Sometimes the fact that you even have options is valuable. Imagine a world where you don't have um, a choice regarding decisions you make about the things you want to do. And everything is just forced, it's just one way. It doesn't make a lot of sense. But where you have options, there's more value in that. Because certain options may allow you edge against certain risks or manage certain uncertainties better. That is the essence of this topic. For example, in tangible projects or in investments, companies have options. Options to delay a project till a particular uncertainty has cleared away. For example, a major investment decision you want to make as a UK investor in other European countries, but a Brexit vote was imminent and you do not know whether there was going to be Brexit or the UK was going to remain in the European, uh, in the European Union or Eurozone. Now, that's an uncertainty. That option to delay your investments can help you clear that uncertainty and then make the optimal decision. It's important to always remember that those, such options are valuable. Sometimes it may be an option to expand a project gradually. You have $10 million. It's the amount you've saved for several years. An investment opportunity is before you. It's either you put the entire $10 million or you invest in stages. Stage one, invest $2 million. See how it turns out. Put in another $3 million. See how it turns out. Put in another $5 million ETC. That ability to expand gradually definitely is a valuable option compared to a situation where you have to put the entire $10 million at once. But the question, the real question is, Shay, how do I value these options that you are talking about? That will be our focus here. So we're going to be learning option valuation methods, uh, particularly the Black Schools option valuation model on the option pricing. Once we are done with investment appraisal, we move on to another key decision made by managers and CEOs this time, because this is a more fundamental decision to the business around managers and acquisition. In accounting, you would have remembered that there's a difference between acquiring an asset and acquiring a business. So here we are talking about business acquisition or mergers. Uh, when it comes to maybe like similar companies or even companies that are in different lines of businesses. So there are two fundamental things we are going to cover here. We're going to review certain theoretical concepts and bases for M&A, concepts and bases. So for example, there are two ways organizations generally grow. You can grow organically, which is an internal growth, or you can grow through mergers and acquisition. 
There are businesses that definitely value growth through uh, their internal strategy and gradual internal growth, which will fall organic growth. There are some businesses that value growing at a faster pace. And that typically happens through mergers and acquisition. You think of our Nigerian environment, you pick a bank like Access Bank, by far becoming a very large bank, a very, very large bank, whether looking at deposit liabilities or number of branches or customers, mainly because of the acquisitions that the bank has entered into over time. You can as well compare that with other banks that have grown organically. So the question is, what are the benefits of growing through M and A's? What are the benefits of growing organically? What are the incentives that drive mergers and acquisition? What are the types of mergers and acquisition that we have? Why do mergers and acquisitions sometimes fail? In fact, research shows that quite a lot of mergers and acquisitions fail. Why? If you, are, uh, if you have a hostile predator that wants to acquire your business, what defenses can you put in place, which at the end of the day will be in the best interest of the shareholders? Or how can you convince your shareholders that a potential merger and acquisition is good for them? and that there will be post mergers synergies that would arise. How do you finance mergers and acquisitions? What are the types of synergies that can emerge from mergers and acquisitions? These are some of the questions that we will cover in that section. The next section will be valuation. So under this section, we'll be focusing on various methodologies that you can use to value mergers and acquisitions or to value businesses and to determine the synergies that may arise from such you know, uh, business combinations. Whether it's the uh, dividend valuation approach or is the PE ratio valuation approach or it's the free cash flow valuation models we're going to be looking at those valuation metrics that we have in your syllabus. The next section of the syllabus will then be corporate reconstruction and reorganization. Another very important area. There comes a time in a business where you will say that it is good for us to focus on our survival or maybe even let's say to focus on being a whole lot more competitive beyond our competitors. Now, this is very, very, very important. Whether you are trying to achieve higher levels of competitiveness, maximize shareholders' wealth, you know, survive a potential liquidation, or, you know, um, see how you can improve the operational efficiency of your business. One way to look at is how can I reconstruct my capital and how can I reorganize my business? So our focus, first of all, will be on capital reconstruction and then we will move on to business reorganization. Capital reconstruction often involves a situation where you change the mix of debt and equity within your business or on your balance sheet. A business may decide to engage in a leverage recapitalization, which is a very aggressive you know, form of uh, uh, recapitalization aggressive form of care. You may decide to engage in a debt equity swap where you deliverage your business by asking debt holders to exchange their debt for equity interest in the business. You may decide sometimes to even buy back certain equities so as to, for example, maybe improve your EPS or reduce 
uh, the prospects of a hostile takeover from another leader. So there are several reasons and several ways, even dividend policies can be restructured, you know, in order to reconstruct your capital. A company that has a dividend payout of 50%, for example, may decide to reduce dividend payout if it intends to buffer its equity capital. Although you then want to consider how shareholders react to that, given the change in dividend payout. And how will the market react to it? But beyond reorganizing your capital, there may come a time where you think it's more important I reorganize the structure of my business. This reorganization can be of two types. You can have organizational re restructuring, organizational restructuring, which is quite popular for most businesses. You merge the admin and HR departments, put it under one leadership, and ask some employees to leave, try to improve operational efficiency, or even reorganize your group, merge some subsidiaries together, or um, you know, um, you know, close down some branches that you have in a bid to optimize cost and improve profitability. But there are other fundamental reorganizations that could happen, which we call portfolio reconstruction. Portfolio reconstruction. Portfolio reconstruction typically involves acquiring or disposing certain lines of businesses. For example, think of leveraged buyouts. Think of management buyouts where some management internally come together to buy a part of a business from the current shareholders and then they run it as an independent business. Think of the mergers. While we have talked about the benefits of mergers, for example, some businesses believe that working together, going separate ways is the best way to realize synergies. You may want to do a research on your own. What are those businesses that have engaged in a demerger in the past? It's kind of counterintuitive. You would have thought, okay, certain businesses coming together will probably improve profitability and shareholder wealth. But we've also seen situations where it is best for two business for a business to demerge and resulting in two businesses, you know, operating independently. So we're going to be looking at all of this, but from the exam perspective, what typically happens is the examiner gives you a broad scenario. The examiner gives you options. Option one can be to merge this business or spin off a particular business, sell it. The money you make from selling uh, that business that you, uh, you carved out, um, use it to invest in your continuing business. And then the examiner asks you, do the valuation of the business that they want to sell. What will the balance sheet and POL look like after this the merger or carve out and sale have taken place and the reinvestment takes place? What will the earnings per share, gearing ratio, you know, and some other fundamentals look like after implementing each of these strategies? So you are playing the role of a strategic financial advisor to the board. And so you have to see things from their broad implications rather than just focusing on crunching the numbers uh, that have been given to you. The final part of the syllabus we're going to be looking at is risk management. This area focuses on three key areas or topics. First is the role of the treasury function in an organization. The role of the treasury function in an organization. The second area is edging currency risk. Edging currency risk. While the third area is edging interest rate risk interest rate risk. Now, 
the issue here is the treasury function plays a very important role. So we're going to be looking at how can the treasury function be structured and what roles do they play, both locally and for an international treasury function. But beyond that, we are also going to be looking at risks that an organization is exposed to, particularly these two financial risks, foreign exchange risk and interest rate risk. The focus will be on how to use derivative instruments and contracts to hedge these risks. Now, this is typically an area that can be potentially complex. So one of the things I do in my class is to teach this area when uh, the brain is still very fresh, <laughs> you know, much earlier in the class. So we do a little bit of impact of financing on investment decisions, you know, and then we may probably move on to uh, risk management and then afterwards come back to the standard cash flows. So um, there are various methods you can use to hedge currency and interest rate risk from forward contracts, option contracts, to futures and, and swaps. We're going to be looking at all of that. Now let's focus on the exams. What's the structure of the exams? It's three hours, 15 minutes, as you already know. You have a 15 minutes uh, period to pretty much read and plan for your exams. So you have the question in front of you, you have that time to go through the detail and everything, and then you have three hours uh, to answer the questions, even though I think you can as well also write, write within the 15 minutes period. Section A will be 50 mark long case study question, which will attempt to te uh, test multiple areas of the syllabus. Students should not be carried away by the fact that this will be calculation only. As a matter of fact, experience has shown that it's about 50-50. So about 50% or in very rare cases, maybe 55% will be computational, while the remaining 50% or in rare cases 45%, will be discursive. So if you believe that it's all about calculating work, calculating MPV, edging currency risk using swaps, without discussing the implications of what you have done and advising senior management or the board on the actions they should take, then you are getting the scope of the paper wrong. You have to be very comfortable to narrate and discuss your findings and other topical area that the examiner may ask you related to the syllabus. Section B will most likely focus on specific areas of the syllabus. So you may get a question that focuses on risk management, for example, or a question that focuses on mergers and acquisition. All questions are compulsory. And as I've said, it will be a mix of narrative and calculation. All papers are computer based, and I'm sure you know that already by now. All topics and exam sections will be examinable in either section A or section B, but every exam will have questions which have a focus on syllabus section B and so I'll go back again. What is syllabus section B? Advanced investment appraisal. What is syllabus section E? Treasury and advanced risk management. So the examiner is telling you that I may miss any other thing, but I can never miss section B and E when I'm setting my questions. I'm sure you understand that. What are the common pitfalls that candidates uh, need to avoid, you know, as you prepare for this particular paper? First is not covering the syllabus. You know, the examining team always talk about this, that candidates sometimes tend to focus on specific topics and they don't have a good and detailed knowledge of the syllabus. You cannot apply knowledge that you don't have. You have to have the knowledge before you can apply. Next, poor time management. 
this is a very real issue. Some people rewrite this paper, not because the knowledge and application is not there, but they are not very good with managing time. So it's very essential for you to do mock exams, you know, practice three hours, 15 minutes before you get into the exam hall, particularly how you will use the, uh, you know, uh, platform that is provided by ECCA. Extremely important. Not responding directly to question requirements. Uh, there are different ways to look at this. One is the core requirement. The other is the requirement verb. If a requirement verb asks you to evaluate, hello, ask hello, you she. to assess, hello. Hello, yeah. Shay. Sorry, uh, I have a question regarding the time management. Sorry, sorry, you're not able to ask a question now. I had said that okay. earlier. Yeah, please. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, go on. Please just hold on. I will acknowledge you when it's time to ask questions, okay? Now, not responding directly to question requirements. Um, So if you have a requirement verb that says evaluate, and then you have another requirement verb that says recommend, they are two different things, for example. Recommend us to come with a conclusion, whether they should go for option A, or option B, or option C, or what strategy are you recommending? So if you do all the analysis, all the assessments, and then you leave your answers open, you do not get the marks for recommendation. If you're asked to calculate, or you're asked to discuss, obviously the scope is different. You can't get full marks if I don't see some computational work regarding this requirement verb of calculate, right? So it's very important that you focus on the requirement verb. You also have to focus on what is asked, particularly the use of the word and. So think of a situation where the examiner says, calculate the weighted average cost of capital for the project and evaluate the position of the various stakeholders affected by the project. So there are two requirements there. One, you've got to calculate the work. And you've got to focus on the other section, which says evaluate the impact on the various stakeholders. Next, for structure to the numerical and written answers. Um, it's very important that you get your structure right. Typically, you want to solve the numerical aspects on your spreadsheets and then the discursive aspect on the word document or uh, the other document provided for providing your narrative answers. You have to get your structure right, because typically question one, for example, will be asking you to prepare a report for the board. I mean, you don't prepare a board paper anyhow. You probably have your main discussion paper where you have the subjects, where you have an introductory paragraph, where you have the body that reflects the discussion and your findings, and where you have a conclusion. Then you have an appendix, which is where your spreadsheet comes in that contains your computations. Even for the section B part of the question, it's very essential that you, you, you have a very good presentation. Machines are not marking your paper. They are human beings, the examining team, and they need to be able to follow through your thought process so that if at all they can identify that you genuinely made a mistake in a particular area, you won't be penalized unduly for that. It's also important at this level to state your assumptions. Marks are usually given 
for candidates who state clearly the assumptions they have made, particularly regarding the numerical aspects of the questions. A candidate gets an MPV that is positive. Another candidate may get another MPV that is negative for the same question, but they may get, they may both get full marks. It's a function of the reasonableness of the assumption that they have made and they have stated on their scripts. Excessive use of bullet points instead of discussion. Another very important issue that you must avoid or flaw that you must avoid is not having surface answer. I call them surface answers. That is answers that lack depth. You are asked to analyze the impact of a potential project or investment on various stakeholders. These stakeholders could be debt holders, equity holders, employees, creditors, customers, communities, etc. You cannot just give one one line sentence like you're writing bullet point and expect to earn full marks. Usually the requirement verb at this level is not identified or described. It's often discussed, assessed, evaluated. And so those are higher level requirements that will require that you put on your thinking cap, put on your structuring cap, and give an answer that reflects your experience and your level of preparation. Not taking account of marks available when answering questions. Now, what's the point here? It, it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to have a four marks question take you 10 minutes to respond and you spend the same 10 minutes on a 15 marks question. Obviously, you know that doesn't make sense. Candidates are expected to look at the mark allocated to the question you want to answer and give responses that will enable you and those marks. Adequate enough to earn those marks. Now, I must be honest with you. ACC is one of the professional bodies in the world that really do want their candidates to pass based on the volume of resources they make available to their candidates. One example is the marking scheme. As a candidate preparing for a strategic professional level paper, you must work with marking scheme. You must practice questions on your own. Take a look at how the examiner solves that question as you try to mark your scripts. But more importantly, take a look at how marks have been awarded. That builds you and gives you the confidence to know how much and to what extent to write if you are in the exam hall. For example, if I'm solving a question on black schools option pricing, where I need to get D1, I need to get D2, I need to get ND1, I need to get ND2, I need to get the value of a call option and the value of a put option. Don't worry, you will see the details of this as we move on. As a candidate before you enter the exam at all, you should know how many marks do they typically allocate for getting D1 correctly? How many marks do they typically allocate for getting D2 correctly? ND1, ND2, value of call and value of put option. You should know. If the examiner has asked me to calculate weighted average cost of capital and they put seven marks there, you should know how many marks are they likely to give me for calculating cost of equity correctly, how many marks for calculating cost of debt correctly, and how many marks for putting it together to calculate work. Just it's very important. And if it's a discursive element, is it going to be two marks per relevant point? Or is it one mark? You should know. That you can only tell by attending lectures, paying attention to exam techniques, 
as you know, I will dish out during our classes. And then also using the examiner's marking scheme, which is available on the ACCA website. Finally, not taking a balanced approach that is focusing on very specific areas of syllabus at the detriment of others. Wrapping up now, mock exams. One thing that ACCA continues to emphasize is the fact that they notice that the more students take mock exams, the higher their chances of passing. And I must be very honest with you. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to make a very categorical statement, but I don't want you to misjudge my intentions. Some people will only pass this paper if they subject themselves to that process of doing three hours mock exams two or three times before they enter the exam hall. So you can see I'm not talking about reading the concept, attending lectures, uh, uh, solving past questions. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sit down, open your computer, pick a full 100 marks question, time yourself three hours, 15 minutes, go to the practice platform, solve within three hours, 15 minutes, and stop when it's three hours, 15 minutes, and give yourself some feedback. Or if it's the final mock of the school, get the feedback from the tutors. You, you, you will never know the benefit you will get from that until you do it. And I usually share a personal example. Um, um, uh, even though it's not ACCA, but it's really around the concept of mock exams. You know, as you know, um, we, we provide tuition at Ivy League for CFA exams. Now, some years back when I was writing my CFA exams, I was writing level three. And at that time, level three was uh, in two sessions. So you have morning session and afternoon session. Morning section is nine to 12, afternoon session is two to 5 p.m. Same day. Now, the morning session, they're about 11 case studies, which you have to finish within the time. Obviously complex case studies, because you have to deal with derivatives, uh, you know, uh, fixed income, you know, all those economics and all those things. Now, I had attempted level three the first time and I failed. Why did I fail? When they said stop writing for the morning session, I had only attempted six of 11 case studies. I think it was seven actually, seven, of 11 case studies. And so when they said stop writing, I looked at the remaining four case studies and there were things I could answer because I had prepared for the exams. <laughs> Sorry, by studying, by practicing past questions, by doing revision, but little or no mock exam. I don't think I did any mock exam. So my time management was poor. I already knew it would take a miracle to use the afternoon session to overcome my failures in the morning session so that I will pass the exams. When the result was released, I failed. Uh, there's something they call performance band at that time. My performance band was 10. What does 10 mean? It's interesting. I don't think they use that performance band again. It means that I was among the top 10% of students that failed. So it means it was in substance marginal failure. Why did I fail? Not because I didn't prepare for the exam in terms of understanding the concepts and practicing questions, but I was very poor with time management. So when it was time to do my second, uh, when it was time to attempt it the second time, nobody told me before I did the needful. The week 
30 exam. I did four mock exams, four mock exams. Now, let me tell you what this means. Four mock exams for ACCA, four mock exams in CFA for ACCA will be equivalent to doing eight mock exams. Because when I tell you I did four mock exams, it means Monday, I did morning session, afternoon session, three hours each. Tuesday, morning session, afternoon session, three hours each. I did that four times. So that would be equivalent to doing eight mock exams if I was writing ACCA. When I got into the example, I already had the strategy. I was on my 10th case study. I didn't do the questions in order. I did it based on my level of comfort, which is something I picked up during my mock exams. I was on my 10th case study when they said stop, stop writing. So when I looked at the only one that I could not attempt, I noticed that my knowledge there was not very strong. So I was happy to give them my script since you know, I didn't really know what I was going to write anyway. I did my afternoon session very well and I passed. I passed because I learned from that mistake and I focused on disciplining myself to write those mock exams. It's obviously not easy subjecting yourself to that. So I see that statement that I've said again. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been taking AFM for over 10 years, so I know what I'm saying. Some people will only pass this paper if and only if they complement their preparation with at least three mock exams, because that's the effort this paper actually requires. And even by extension, the other optional papers, you don't really have a lot of choice because they all have a very high level of uh, difficulty at least if we look at the global pass rates all these optional papers the average pass rate is 30 something percent so uh, based on that alone you can tell that you know you need to put in some efforts uh you need to put in some efforts to 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 pass the exams i hope that was convincing enough enough because i must tell you a lot of students don't like doing mock exams and I don't know why. All right, so there are lots of details here. This is my last slide. There are lots of details here. Uh, obviously, this is also from the examining team. So I'm just going to run through them. Um, so the first thing here is how to approach. Uh, so some useful tips on how to approach the AFM exam. OK. So you will be required to demonstrate your ability to read and digest quickly comprehensively and detailed questions. So you must be fast with reading. You must be able to digest. You see a lot of people read and then just move on to solving the question, but you've got to digest the question. As we move on in our classes, I'm going to be talking more around this concept of digesting. I'm going to be talking more about digesting the question because sometimes you need to be able to sit back, relax and say, what are they really asking me? What's the scenario that the examiner has given to me? Apply relevant knowledge and skills, so application is more important at this level. Professional judgment will be required, and you should be able to make recommendations on financial management decisions or financial management decisions. These are the pillars of the syllabus. I've gone through that. I will not go through that again. And then regarding tips for succeeding in this paper, it says break down the requirements into all constituent parts to ensure every part is answered. So an example, September 2018 question says evaluate the preferred edging choices and you see that's the AND syndrome. Evaluate the debt finance needed and evaluate whether the project should be undertaken. Evaluating whether the project should be undertaken or not. Now, you will see that there are also uh, there are lots of or multiple requirements, and the verb here often relates to evaluate. So that's why you will see on this other side. 
the examining team have highlighted the key verbs they will do frequently test, discuss, estimate, evaluate. You should understand what the matters to what matters to businesses and viewpoints of stakeholders who are interested in the subsequent decision based on the discussion and evaluation asked for. You must use the information in the scenario. You must communicate your findings and recommendations clearly and concisely. It's not about telling too much stories, but you also have to put some depth in your thought process and the answers you are providing. And then apply professional skills, whether it's related to evaluation, or a critical appraisal of options that are before you. There will typically be four professional marks for question one related to uh, you know, applying professional skills. Now we've got here advice from the examining team. Supplement your studies with wider reading. Now let me talk about this. Some of you in my class, you will already have that, uh, that character or that behavior no that's not really the word i'm looking for that uh, you know that practice of wider reading you look at financial times you look at economists or maybe even if you don't subscribe to these things maybe even your instagram page you know what would you follow on instagram which pages do you follow on instagram ask yourself that question so if you're a financial management student, for example, and you are active on Instagram or on social media, there are some finance pages that you should be following to at least know what is happening around the world on economics, on finance, on business, and things like that. In addition to any other entertaining reasons why you know, you, you browse those pages. So it's really important you ask yourself on a Friday, what happened this week? What happened in Europe? What happened in the UK? What's the economic situation in Nigeria? What are the headlines? What are the top mergers and acquisition that the world is talking about? You should know those things as an AFM student. So wider reading is important. It's not just really about the syllabus. And I can clearly tell you there are exam questions that you can only answer when you demonstrate your wider reading capabilities. In the past, they have asked about European debt crisis, which happened in 2011, 2012. In the past, they have asked about the global economic crisis, which happened in 2007, 2008. In the past, they have asked about major mergers and acquisitions between healthcare companies, for example, and the implications that have on stakeholders and regulators alike. So wider reading is very important. So the examining team is telling you that, not me. I'm talking about the ACCA AFM examining team. Number two. Be aware that more than one topic area of the syllabus may be examined in a question. Relate any discussion or evaluation to the scenario. That is, context is very important. Use your exam time effectively. Good time management cannot be overemphasized. Structure your answers well. Presentation is critical. Writing a good answers and how to demonstrate professionalism. Use an appropriate format. So whether it's a report, use a report format. Plan a logical structure. Use suitable headings and subheadings, and then what? Write clearly and concisely. And obviously, you have this huge amount of resources that are available on ACCA's website. So you can always check, um, you know, how to step into AFM from FM. You can always check our uh, the AFM study guide. You can always check examiner's approach, how to pass the paper, uh, you know, pass questions, examiner's report, which is really debriefing how candidates performed related to a preceding diet. So at this point, thank you very much.
for uh, listening to me regarding introduction to AFM. Again, my name is Shay, and I'm the course leader for AFM at Ivy League Associates. Thank you. Um, um, admin, can you stop recording, please?